Well, guys, I want to invite you to grab hold of a copy of the Scriptures. Join us this morning. We are going to be in Mark chapter 11. It's a special message this morning, uh, not continuing this morning in our series in Corinthians. We will be back there after our uh, time during the Easter celebration, the, the Passion Week. But this morning, a special message in Mark 11. So if you've got a Bible, make your way there. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in front of you. Grab one of those, but don't use the page number on the screen because I forgot to update it. So you got to find it on your own. you got to find it on your own, but hopefully you can find Mark chapter 11 quickly. Use a Bible app if that works for you well. One way or another, have a copy of the Scriptures. If you're joining us online or in the overflow, same invitation to have a copy of the Scriptures open. Well, as you're heading there, why? Why are we having a special message? Well, again, just to be really, really clear, we just got back from Israel. We had 21 of us that made our way to Israel. We got back late Friday night, and so um, there's just not a lot of space and that to prepare a message for this morning. But I also wanted to give you a little bit of an overflow to share with you a little bit uh, of what God uh, spoke in the midst of that, at least to me. I mean, there's much, much more than we could unpack here. I don't know if it'll make sense. In fact, again, I know some of you just got here, so I want to say again the same thing that I said in the announcement space. Hey, we just got back, and, and so uh, I just want to just between you and I admit I'm a little bit tired and I'm a little bit jet lagged. So it's entirely possible that I'm going to say some really weird things. Uh, and I could be like, I don't know what that means. I don't know why I said that. So let's just, you and I just give me like, okay, okay yeah, <laughs> God make it work. People were in the first service said that they got it. That has no guarantee that it'll work now. And, and so just admitting our need for God's grace and strength, hoping that he would meet us this morning as we give you just a little bit of a perspective of where we are. So before we dive into this passage in Mark 11, I thought I would just take a moment and just share with you a few pictures. Now, just a few. Uh, we literally saw dozens and dozens, probably like, I bet you we saw 75 spaces. I mean, honestly, so so I'm not walking you through every space that we went. Um, I'm not showing you all the pictures because that would be thousands. I'm not joking. We have thousands of pictures. But I wanted just to show you a few pictures. But before I do that, quick apology. Our screen, our, if you didn't know it last week, kind of our bulb died. We have a new one on the way. So it's a little bit washed out more than normal. And it's even worse when pictures are shown. So we're going to pull the lights down just for a moment so you can walk with us through it. I'll just show you a few pictures. I promise it won't be a whole bunch, but just a few uh, to give you a flavor for where we were. So we made our way. This is our group, 21 of us. He went over to Israel. This is us at JFK on our way out, heading towards Israel. We had a glorious time. Uh, we had a great tour guide. Uh, his name is Baruch. He is a Messianic believer and best tour guide we've had yet in, in the midst of our times heading to Israel. Just his insights, but just, just the authenticity of his life uh, flowing into it was really significant. Uh, so we landed over in Israel. This was our first spot. Uh, we landed, it went to Joppa, which is right there on the Mediterranean coast, thinking both of Jonah's rebellion uh, when he runs away from God, but significantly of Peter, uh, of where that's really where the gospel begins to move forward, uh, where he heads over to uh, Caesarea and, and just begins to share the gospel. So we just stood there on that space, beginning to think about the, the heart of the gospel that moved forward and the heart that we want to be a part of of the things that God had for us. So a beautiful space there on the Mediterranean. Uh, you can't really see it through there, but there's a sun and a sea there behind that. Just a, a glorious space where we got a chance to go and be a part of it. Then the next day we headed further north. Uh, we went up to Mount Carmel where Elijah faces the 850 false prophets talking about some of what we just sung. Like God is God. Like who are you going to serve? Like, we need to serve him, and we thought through what that looks like. We taught about it, considered just the realities of the things that God had for us, just significant spaces. Then we went a little further north. We went to Nazareth and overlooked the city where Jesus uh, was in the midst of that, getting to see the things that were there, which was just a, a great space for us to be able to, to be a part of that and do that. Then we ended up at the Sea of Galilee, so uh, the next day, and uh, just pausing here for a moment because this is a significant part of the story. So here in the Sea of Galilee, um, we sat there and we talked at this space about how Jesus restored Peter following the resurrection, uh, following F Peter's uh, rebellion, and it just seemed like one of the lessons that had already been building began to really take shape, at least for me, and again, I'm sharing some of that this morning, but our tour guide was just sharing with us, and he was telling us that we really need to consider the, the value of eating together and the, and the picture of fellowship that is really there within the biblical mindset, but honestly, even within the Middle Eastern mindset, even to this day. 
that to eat with somebody is a significant just, just commitment. Uh, to sit down there and eat a meal with somebody is, okay, you're eating from a piece of bread, I'm eating from a piece of bread, and at that very moment as we eat the same thing, we're uh, just expressing our acceptance of one another, we're expressing a sense of unity and, and, and relationship and fellowship that for the Middle Eastern mindset is hugely significant. This is why, for example, when Jesus would eat with tax collectors and sinners, the Pharisees would be like, what, you're eating with them? Like, you're, you can't do that. You can't eat with people like that. It would move even into the church. So in the book of Galatians, you'd have, you know, Peter messing up with this and Paul having to confront him for kind of withdrawing from the Gentiles, not eating with them because eating together has this picture of a fellowship together, this place of what that would be like. And so in, in that mindset, it's huge. Now, there's no way for us to fully get there. We live in an American system, and I know that even if you can understand this a little bit, we don't feel it the same way, but they do. In fact, it was interesting. Uh, one of the ladies that joined us used to come here. Many of you guys know her, Jamie, and uh, she is actually overseas right now, but she joined us on the trip, and she's serving right, she's working right now in Iraq. And she, she was telling us after this whole story, she said, you know, honestly, it was an interesting thing. She had a conversation uh, with some of the uh, people there in Iraq, and they said, it's still that way. So that as there are factions fighting in Iraq, if you've had dinner at somebody's house, you would never attack it. Yeah, you know, like, you know, like if they're going to have a war, it's like someone would like, I can't attack that house. I ate there. Like that's not a house. I, I can't touch that house because I've eaten with them. And it's actually kind of a problem. Like, okay, well, you're going to have to attack this house. You know, it still is so much a part of their mindset. And so that began a lesson that's going to flow out a lot into the message this morning, or at least I hope it does, this picture of eating together and fellowship. And I can honestly say that that was a big part of our trip. In fact, I uh, asked a lot of our folks that went, like, what did they enjoy uh, about the trip? Where was God meeting them? And there's a lot of good answers to that. God met people in a lot of significant ways. But honestly, one of the things that, that was just almost universal was we enjoyed the fellowship. And I can literally tell you this, we ate from one side of Israel to the other. I mean, like, no joke. I mean, like, this is us eating fish there, but I mean, really, it just felt like we're eating again. I mean, we literally, I mean, incredible foods and way too much food, um, way too many desserts and way too much ice cream. I mean, we just ate, but it was good. It was, it was good, but there was a sense of eating together and fellowship together that was a huge part of the story and, and a huge part of what God did in our lives. Okay, well, keeping going, that's us in Galilee. So we continued there. We went to Capernaum. This is a synagogue that uh, really, it has its foundations back to when Jesus, Jesus would have taught there, which was just significant for us. Uh, we j got to sail on a boat. It might not look like it, but that's on the Sea of Galilee. There's actually water there, but I know it's kind of washed out. Unless you're on the overflow or online, you're like, I can see it, but that's because you're, you're, but we can't. So <laughs> there it is, but we literally did. We're on the Sea of Galilee, just an incredibly beautiful space. Now we say sea, but let's just be clear. It's a big lake. Uh, you know, it's not like an ocean. I mean, it's a big lake, but it's beautiful. It's an absolutely beautiful location, and so we enjoyed our time there, but then we began to head uh, south. We, oh, I'm sorry, before we left the Sea of Galilee, we had a time of, of just baptisms right there at the edge of it as the Jordan River flows out, and so many of the folks were baptized afresh in that, just identifying with Christ in fresh ways, and just a beautiful space of being able to do that. Then we went up north, and so we got to go to Caesarea Philippi. But if you can notice from the picture, um, it, we had some incredibly beautiful days, but we had some cold days. <laughs> like, we had rain. We had, like, rain on three of the days that was just, like, one of them. So we're up there, but we had a great group of people. Like, they just trudged through. I mean, umbrellas, rain jackets, we just kept going. It's like, we're not, we're not going to miss seeing what God did. And so we did. We got to see this. And so we're up at Caesarea Philippi where Peter confesses the Lord, which was a, a lot of fun. Then we began to head south. We went to Beit Shan, and so here we're fellowshipping together. Um, just kidding. Uh, if you don't know what this is, uh, this is a, a Roman bathroom. Uh, like, this, uh, this one that they all did together. If you can see the kind of, like, little slits. It's actually had running water under it, you know. So, hey, we were really just, I don't know, my silly sense of humor. But we were a good fellowship together in the midst of it, so I'll leave that. Um, we went to Masada up on, on the desert, which is just a, a, an incredible space of seeing where the, the last refuge of the Jews were in 70 A.D., uh, then we went all the way down south, gorgeous space, went to the Red Sea, uh, sailed on it. Some of us went scuba uh, snorkeling. Some people just walked around it. Just a great, just an enjoyable day in the midst of it. And then we began our journey. We went back up north and we spent the last part of our, our journey 
in Jerusalem, and there's just no way to unpack how significant that was, just all that we saw, incredible spaces of, of where Jesus was in the midst of it. We had fun in the midst of it. We just were like rode camels, kind of had a, kind of a, a, an experience in that, just fellowshipping over that. But really on that final day, we went there to the garden tomb, and I can just tell you uh, it was a joy just to celebrate that, just what we're going to talk about on Easter Sunday, He's not there. He's, he's alive. He's risen from the grave. And, and just a joyous kind of journey. So we had a great time. This is our final picture uh, from the tour, kind of as we were getting ready to leave the airport on Friday morning kind of thing, like one in the morning or something like that. And so just a good space, but man, we just really enjoyed it. And so thank you guys for your prayers. Thanks for being a part of it. And again, I know that's just a little bit of pictures, but let me back up to one. Last picture that I'll show before we dive into our passage, or last little section I'll show before we dive into our passage here in Mark 11. On that day in Jerusalem, one of the spaces, on, on our days in Jerusalem, one of the spaces that we went to was called the Southern Steps. The Southern Steps. It's steps that lead up to the Temple Mount. And following all the incredible destructions that Jerusalem had, it's one of the few spaces that we can honestly say, Jesus walked here. Like, undoubtedly, firmly, we know that he did. These steps lead up to the Temple Mount. In fact, if you can see it, like right behind me there, there's some of the remade kind of modern steps right next to some of the original steps. It's original steps that, again, would lead to the Temple Mount, that in those days, if you were making your way to the temple, you would climb these steps. You would then enter through uh, these three gates that are right there, one of these three gates, going through them leading up to the Temple Mount. Now, they're sealed uh, during the Ottoman time they sealed them, but originally these were the entrances that you entered into this climbing up. And so this is a, a model of the city that we went and saw, if it makes any other sense. These steps kind of, you know, climbing up there, entering into those doors. You would again go through those doors and come out up the steps leading to the Temple Mount. So this is a picture we took from the top looking down uh, of what it would have looked like. And so this is how you got up on the Temple Mount. This is how that happened. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about there. I want to talk to you about what we talked about on that day, that we talked about Jesus climbing these steps, that he did so over and over. But one of the days that we wanted to think through is the day that we're going to think through here in Mark chapter 11. So again, that's where I want to invite you to now. And you can raise the lights back up as we kind of dive into this this morning, wanting again to see that reality that we thought about then that we want to invite you to think with us now. So let's take a moment before we go into that. I've given you some pictures and stuff like that, but now we want to dive specifically into the Word of God. So I want to lead you into prayer. I'm going to ask that you would pray with me. Let's ask that God would speak to us right now, what he has us to hear. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you that you're at work in our lives. Um, Thank you for bringing those of us who went to, got to go journey to Israel home safely. And now as we seek to share just a tiny bit of the overflow, would you help it to make sense? Or do you know that what I'm bringing is weakness? That's always true. But I just admit it afresh right now. And I'm asking that you would go far and above that you would speak to us by your power, by your word, by your authority, and that you communicate real things into our lives and that we'd hear them right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this morning is a little bit kind of a, kind of a flow out from where we were in Jerusalem and in Israel, but it's also preparing you for where we're going to be this next week because we already talked about it in our announcements. Starting on Saturday, we're moving into the Holy Week the Passion Week of Jesus, when we think about those final, that final week of Christ. So next Sunday is going to be a place where we talk about Palm Sunday, what that looks like. And so we'll talk about Jesus' presentation. We'll talk about the triumphal entry in the midst of that. We'll talk about Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem. But then one other thing happens on that day that we may or may not even talk about next week because we're going to talk about it now is that Jesus then climbs the steps to the city of Jerusalem. The very steps that we were standing on in those days, he climbs those steps up onto the Temple Mount and he cleanses it. And he does this incredible work that I want to invite you to think with me about right now that, that's here in our passage. Now, as you're heading there with me, understand this. Jesus does this twice. It actually bookends his public ministry. 
that the very first thing, one of the first things he does publicly is he cleanses the temple, and it's one of the last things he does. Like, this is what's going to happen on Palm Sunday, and it really does end his public proclamation. It's, it's days before the cross, but those final days will be spent with his disciples, really investing into them. So his public ministry is bookended by these two things. So let me put the first one on the screen uh, that's there. It begins there in John chapter 2, where it lets us know that Jesus does this. And so we have this passage where it tells us in John 2 verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Hey, pause with me just for a moment. He ascended to Jerusalem. It's one of those fun realities when we go to Israel that we talk about. Uh, It's true geographically many times, but it's much more true spiritually. So they always talk about it that way. No matter where you're coming, if you're going to Jerusalem, you're ascending. Uh, You're ascending. But it was funny. We were talking about how I was going to share today. And it was kind of just from a few of us. They're like, hey, go and tell them we like ascended and ascended and ascended to Jerusalem. I mean, we walked and we walk stairs. And again, some of you are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But if you went with us, you know. It's like, man, I, we, where did they invent all the stairs? We kept on going up. So we're ascending to Jerusalem. My dry humor aside, hey, that's where they were. Jesus ascends. But he ascends the very steps that we were standing on on that day. And he goes up into the temple. And he found, it says, in the temple, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, note that because we'll come back and talk about it in a moment, those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. I mean, this is kind of how he begins. He says, hey, don't do it. This is not what this is supposed to be about. It goes on to tell us that the disciples, when they remembered uh, that Jesus did this, they remembered out of the Old Testament that zeal for your house has eaten me up, it would say. Kind of a prophetic message of Christ, his passion uh, for the house of God, his passion for what that would be, and certainly he did. So he begins his ministry that way, and now he ends his public ministry that way. So you have your Bibles open there. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 11, verse 15. Reads it this way. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple. So he climbs the steps that we were standing on. He goes into the temple and he began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. So Jesus does this. We're watching this whole event. We're watching these cleansing. It bookends his ministry. And in the midst of it, one of the realities that you need to feel and and see in the midst of this is that Jesus exposes kind of religious exploitation. He exposes what that is. Now, he does a number of things, right? You just read it with me, both in the John passage in here, where it lets us know that he begins to drive out those who were buying and selling, that he overturns the tables of the money chambers. And you just got to imagine this for a moment. I mean, he's like literally flipping these tables over. He's driving out those who are selling doves, slipping over their chairs, knocking them over who are doing this. Now, here's kind of the what realities we need to think through for a moment. Like, why? Like, what's happening here? What is it we need to understand? Please understand. It's not just about money. It's not just about that. It's about exploitation. It's about this place that one of the sad realities that was true then in Jerusalem, but it's been true throughout church history, but honestly, hey, for some of you who went with us to Israel, you will know this. It's one of the little undercurrents that's just kind of sad. It's one of the undercurrents that is sad that just this religious exploitation that everybody is trying to figure out how to make a buck, that people are always trying to get money out of people. People are always trying to do that. And one of the sad realities is sometimes it, it happens in the midst of God's people. So as we read through history, here's how we know it happened. So people would come to Jerusalem 
And one of the things that they would do was that for every person, they would give kind of this half shekel. They would give this, what was kind of, was kind of called a temple tax. It wasn't a, a large amount of money, but it was this place of acknowledging your personal uh, part in that whole thing, kind of given to us in the Old Testament. But in this day and age, here's what we know that happened. The rulers up there on the temple mount began to say, well, you know, you don't want to give God kind of secular money. You don't want to give God like the money that you got from other places. So if you have money that's not our money, well, then you ought to exchange it for actual royal money so that you can give to God a, a holy shekel. Oh, yeah, it's five times more expensive than you'll get anywhere else. But hey, you want to honor God, right? You know, you want to do that. And so there were literally money changers who were taking your money at a huge markup. Uh, and, and yet, if you wanted to do it, you would have to kind of go and, okay, I guess I need to kind of, you know, spend five times more than anything else just so I can be able to do this. And then on top of that, maybe you would be bringing a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it tells us that the sacrifice you give to God is to be an unblemished sacrifice. You couldn't give to God something that was lame or sick. And Jesus, I mean, in Malachi, I talk about that. that's not the way you do it anywhere else. It is this picture of giving God what is, what is real and costly. But here's what we know that happened in the midst of those days, that it began to be a, a really a huge racket. So you would maybe be bringing your sacrifice and you had to go through inspection and there in the inspection, the guy who would be inspecting your sacrifice would begin, you know, nice that you brought this, this, this but did you notice there's a blemish right here? This is not going to be an expect, you know, ex acceptable sacrifice and so you're going to have to go find another sacrifice and there you would be like, now what do I do? And he'd say, well, I can tell you what, I'll tell you what, my brother Shmuel over here, he happens to have some pre-approved sacrifices, some pre-approved sacrifices that you can go and buy so you could give that to the Lord. Oh yeah, it's five times, 10 times more than you'd have to pay anywhere else, but you know, you could do that. Now, specifically, it tells us that Jesus kicks over the chairs of those who are selling doves. And if you can think this through for a moment, that's really helpful to understand. Is a dove the only sacrifice that people gave? Oh no. I mean, the, the sacrifices were meant to be lambs and goats and, and bulls. But there's a provision in the Old Testament for the poor. And he says, if you can't afford anything else, if you can't afford anything else, you could give a dove as your sacrifice. But here's what's happening. They're exploiting even the poor. They're, they're exploiting, they're, the, the, the idea that they're selling doves, pre-approved sacrifices, is this place of taking advantage of everybody that came there. And so it's this horrible picture of kind of, you know, commercializing it, of ripping people off, of power and monopoly, and kind of just this weird space that was happening on the Temple Mount. So Jesus comes and he knocks these things over. Like he kicks over these things and says, no, like, no, this is not my house. This is not what God wants for his house. So we talk about his house in the Old Testament. That was beginning with the tabernacle, then the temple, but even that would go away. So when we think about God's house, let me quickly tell you, where is God's house today? It's not Calvary Roswell. It's you. The Bible tells us that we're the house of God, that now as, the, as, as Christians, we come together to make up God's temple. We come to make up the house. And so when we think about these realities, these are things that sad even to this day. Now, maybe that's enough. Maybe just saying that, you're like, okay, I get it. Totally get it. I understand why Jesus, I understand why this would book in his ministry. I understand what he's exposing, but just in case we don't. Or maybe because we need to go a little bit de deeper, Jesus teaches us about it. So go back and notice with me what it says. Just beginning there, just ca catching it up, we'll just begin at the end of verse 15. It said, He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. He quotes two Old Testament passages that are incredibly significant, telling us that if we can understand what those things are, we'll understand why this is that way, why this has always been God's heart. He begins to teach first on this place where God says, my house will be called a house of prayer. So keep a marker here in, in Mark chapter 11. We'll come back to it and read it one more time in a moment. But now open up, if you will, to the book of Isaiah. Go to Isaiah 56. 
Isaiah 56, because that's where Jesus is quoting from. That's where he's walking in the midst of it. So Isaiah chapter 56. If you don't know where it is, it's kind of right there in the middle. If you need to use the table of contents in your Bible, do that. Don't be embarrassed. It's great. Just in front of your Bible, have the table of contents, give you the page number, make your way to Isaiah chapter 56. As you're kind of turning to it, I want to begin just reading the verse that Jesus quotes from so you can see it, and then we'll talk about its context. Verse 7, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So Jesus is quoting this passage. He's telling us what God intended for his house. Now, I want to say this and say this carefully, but hopefully helpfully. Sometimes people will read this verse and think that what Jesus is saying is that we need to pray for the world, that we need to pray for all nations. Now, that's a good idea, by the way. Like, you should do that. I mean, if this kind of inspires you to pray for the world, then you could do that, and and please, yes, pray for the whole world. Pray for people to get saved. Yeah, you should do that, but that's not actually what it's speaking about. It's not saying, hey, that we're supposed to be a place that's praying for the world. What he's saying is that the world who is seeking to pray should be able to come into God's house and find that space. Let's talk about prayer just for a moment. He says that his house is to be a house of prayer for all nations. Prayer is a powerful reality that in many ways, it's this picture of a, of, an, of a connection with God, that to pray is to have a, a space where we connect with God, where we're talking to God and he hears. And in one real powerful way, that encompasses everything of what it really is to connect with God. And the world is hungry for that. The world is hungry for that. Now, the sad reality is this, and I know we've talked about this before. Statistics tell us that about 95% of Americans say they pray regularly. 95% of Americans say that prayer is a significant or or just a, a part of their life on a regular basis. Interesting. Can I tell you this? Most people's prayers are ineffective. Most people's prayers are ineffective because we only have access in Jesus. Jesus came and died on the cross, paying for our sins, and one of the great realities is that is that we now get to pray in Jesus' name, that we get an access before God where He hears and answers our prayers. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus and you pray and you feel like maybe your prayers don't reach above the ceiling, They might not. I mean, please don't get me wrong. I mean, God is God. He knows, but your prayers don't have teeth. They don't have access. It only happens in this relationship with God. But people are hungry for it. They're hungry for it. Maybe saying it differently, Charles Spurgeon would say it this way, if one should ask me for an epitome of the Christian religion, I should say that in one word, it's prayer. How do you define what it is to be a Christian? What does it really mean? Hey, we are, we are people that pray. That is what we are. He says, if I was asked what it'll take in the whole of the Christian experience, I should answer prayer. I mean, it's through prayer that we get access to everything that God has for our lives. He says, a man must have been convinced of sin before he could pray. He must have had some hope that there was mercy for him before he could pray. All the elements that would lead us into really praying are the basic elements of the Christian life. In fact, he would say, in fact, all of Christian virtues are locked up in that word, prayer. I just want you to think about it. Everything of what we are in Christ is that. It's no minor thing that when Paul the Apostle gets saved, uh, that God speaks to Ananias and says, hey, go and find him because behold, he's praying. He's praying. I mean, like he's never, never had that before. He's never had that access before. So prayer becomes this beautiful picture of connection with God, this beautiful picture of being able to relate to and know and connect with God. And that reality is what you need to feel for a moment because it's that reality that people should be able to find in the house of God. That's what he's talking about. That's what he begins to unpack. And so go back to verse 3. Notice how it begins, uh, this section, or where he talks about it, and and try to kind of track with the logic that's in the midst of this. 
Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Hey, pause. So so here's going to be a foreigner. This is someone who's not a Jew. This is someone who isn't, you know, having the access isn't a part of it, but they have a heart. They want to know God. They want to know God. And he says, don't let them come to this place and say, I have no space here. I have no space here. He says, don't let that be there. Don't let them say the the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. He goes on to say it this way. Verse 4. I'm sorry, in the middle of verse 3, he says, Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, even to them. I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name. Better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Wow. Okay, so you're tracking, right? So he says, here's these people who, they, they, they're, they're not Jews, but they're hungry for God, and they come to the temple, they come to the house of God, they should be able to say, hey, this is there. And he even speaks to the eunuch, and without just taking you through a, a lot of kind of historical background, this would be those who, boy, even within their culture, have been abused, ostracized, relegated, marked as something that would have been disrespected. He says, hey, to them, you come into my house, you choose my ways, you choose to hold fast to my covenant, you have a place. I'll give you a place and a name. I'll give you a space that if you're going to seek me, hey, that can be what's there. In fact, he goes on in verse 6 and says, And also the sons of the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, who holds fast to my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Wow. Hey, Gentiles, most of us here this morning, that's us. That's us. He says, others who are outside us, I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring to where they find access, where they find help, where they find hope, where they find a space. He says, my house is meant to be this place that the whole world who is looking for connection with God would find it. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be about. That's what we're supposed to do. And if you can understand this, well, guys, this is the gospel. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart that God has for the world. If you can feel what Jesus is explaining here, the heart and the compassion that God says, I am longing to draw to myself people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. I want them to come and find access and help. But in the midst of the religious exploitation that was taking place on the Temple Mount, it was messing up the message. People who are coming from around the world, hungry for God, would come to this space and find not a people who loved God and were seeking Him and praying Him. They found another people, person who was ready to take advantage of them, another person who would abuse them, another person that would make it hard. And, and it's as if they'd come here with this hunger for God and find themselves disappointed, broken, feeling like, well, I guess there's no space for me to find help and hope. There's no space. And God says, no, don't let that happen. That's not what God's house is supposed to be. That's not what we are. We are supposed not to, that is not supposed to be that way. That was again true of the tabernacle, later the temple. But now the temple of God in our day, which is you and me, that we're the space where people should be able to come to us and find hope, and find help in that hunger for God and that seeking of Him. 
And it's what breaks Jesus' heart. It's what's incredibly wrong. And it was wrong then. It still so often mars people who are seeking God. So let me say it this way. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe this is your first time here. Maybe somebody invited you in. And maybe you don't know Jesus. And maybe the reality is that you have come into churches before, places before, and you've been greatly disappointed. You, you've found uh, religious monopolies. You've found arrogance. You've found pride. You've found uh, things that just is everything you didn't want to find. Inside you, you knew you wanted something. Inside you, you were longing for a connection with God, a place somehow where someone would help you find Him, and that's not what you found. Can I tell you, we're so sorry. That's, that's never the heart of God. That has never been the heart of God. What He said is that His house was to be a place that we would be this, this attraction, that, would people would, that anybody who wants to come and know God, hey, come here. Hey, come to us. We're, what Jesus would say, hey, you're the light of the world. You're it. You're, you, you, we're the only way that anybody can find connection to God. We're the only space that that's to happen. So it's a horrendous and horrible reality when somebody who's looking for help, help to, to hear God, to pray to God, to, like, how can, I, how can I know Him? How, how can I have a relationship with God? How, I, I know I want it. How do I get there? It's a horrendous reality when those would come into a space and instead of finding a people that's like, oh, we'd love to tell you. That's exactly what we're here for. Like, join us on our pursuit. Hey, we have access in Jesus and we want you to have access. I mean, that's what they should find. And where that isn't what you find, we're sorry. But please understand, it's not God's heart. It's not Jesus' work. That is not what he's doing. And so we need to hear it. We need to hear it because it's what they needed to hear. It's what we need to hear that Jesus is saying, hey, this is not me. This is not God. This is not the way it works. All right. So we're going to go back to Mark. But before you do it, keep a mark here in Isaiah because we're going to come back to just a few pages after that. And so it'll be easier for you to come back. But now turn back with me over to Mark chapter 11 for a moment because Jesus teaches two principles here in Mark that help us understand why. He, he's so offended why God is so heartbroken over this religious exploitation that was taking place. Again, verse 17, then he taught, saying to them, is it not written? Like this is scripture. This is Old Testament. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Pause. So you got that, right? This is supposed to be a place that the world can come. This is, God's place is supposed to be a place that people can, who are hungry for God can come and find help. Secondly, but you have made it a den of thieves. He says, instead of that, you've made it something entirely other. He tells us that they, and what we need to understand, is this danger of making it a den of thieves. Now, here, he's quoting out of the book of Jeremiah. So, now you can turn back. If you kept your marker there in, 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 in Isaiah, it'll help. Just go to the right a little bit, because right after Isaiah, you get Jeremiah. You're near the end of the book of Isaiah. Jeremiah's at the beginning. Make your way to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Again, just showing you the verse that he quotes from, and then we'll come back and talk about the context. He quotes in verse 11 this. He says, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, God says, even I have seen it, says the Lord. He says, my house has become something it was never meant to be. You've made it a den of thieves. So let's go back to the beginning of the chapter and read what it, how it kind of unpacks leading to that. Verse 1, chapter 7. Then the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this word. So again, just pausing. Again, if it, it again, probably doesn't help everybody, but for those of us who were there, we stood there. We were standing on the very steps before the gates that lead up to the Temple Mount. And it's not only where Jesus stood, it's where Jeremiah stood before that. He says, stand right here. Stand right here as people are coming to go through these gates to enter up onto the Temple Mount. He says it this way, stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, verse 2, and say, hear the word of the Lord. All you of Judah who enter at the gates to worship the Lord, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger or the fatherless and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. So the beginning reality is that they've begun to see the presence of the temple and having the temple there as an excuse, in some senses, to stay in their sin. Boy, I, this is something that's so powerful. I, I just hope I can make some sense out of it. God's intention for you right now is He is longing for you to have a relationship with Him. And the thing that separates you from Him is your sin. Uh, your sin is that which distances you from your God. It's why we need Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, why you need him. Even in a relationship with with Jesus, this is still the thing that always robs us of what God has for our lives. And so the Christian life is always doing battle with sin. It is always, you know, seeking forgiveness, seeking to overcome. Our life is spent in saying, hey, if you'll amend your ways, if you'll walk in repentance, if you'll turn to God, hey, you could find help and God will meet you because this is what we're doing. That's why we come here is to have a relationship with him. But their problem and our problem is that instead of coming for that reality, they began to feel because they had the temple that they were okay. And he says, you've made it a den of thieves not a hard picture to understand. A den of thieves is a, is a safe place for thieves. We think about it here kind of in, you know, New Mexico. We think about it in the Western days. It's kind of like Billy the Kid days. Maybe you want to think about it this way. To have a den of thieves would be like to have a hideout in the mountains where all the, the thieves could go and the law couldn't touch them. It's like, hey, we go there and we are, you know, we're, we're safe. Like this is, this is where the, the enemy can't, the, the law can't touch us and, and, and we're fine. We can do all the bad things we want to do without any repercussions because we're safe. We're safe. He says, you've made the temple a place that makes you feel safe in your sin. You've made the temple a place that makes you feel like you don't have to repent. And, and that's exactly what it's not. It's exactly what this isn't. Now, maybe that makes enough sense all by itself, but to drive it home a little bit more, he invites them to see one other thing. So go back to it there. He says it this way, uh, you know, again, just starting in verse 11 for context, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. But now, go to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it, because of the wickedness of my people Israel. He says, I want you to go to Shiloh. I want you to go to Shiloh and, and see how I feel about this. Now, again, I just want to tell you for us who went to Israel, we did the very thing. We went to Shiloh, one of my favorite spaces going into the land of Israel. We went actually to the place where God says, hey, I want you to go and see it there. Shiloh, it's this amazing location. Again, I know it's a little bit hard to see. That's us, some of our group down there, the place. This is where the, the tabernacle, uh, where God originally kind of you know, made his plant in, in the land of Israel, where that stood. Hey, here's a different picture, kind of just pulling it out of it from the whole valley in the midst of it. So you could see there was this valley place where they were supposed to come, where the tabernacle stood. Now, if that's unfamiliar territory, I'm sorry. There's no way for me to give it to you in its entirety, but it was God's presence. 
So back in the book of Joshua, when the children of Israel first made their journey into the land of Israel, making it the land of Israel, he says it this way, the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the meeting there, for the land was subdued before them. Shiloh, it's where the tabernacle first stood. It's really the center of Israel from the days of Joshua, long before Jerusalem would be kind of the, you know, capital of the nation. Shiloh was the capital. Shiloh was the place of God's presence. Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle stood. Now, there was no tabernacle there when we got there. Hey, but we did go down south, and so we went to see this model of a tabernacle, this incredible space that all pictures Jesus, this place that was meant to be God's presence. So this is us kind of getting a chance to tour some of it. Really fascinating sight. We actually went into the tabernacle, and we did our best to bring the ark back. And just, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I did a little, you know, but we did try, you know, in the midst of it. Um, but hey, this is a shot that Chris got up on the hill and took a shot over it, but you could just see this place that says, hey, this was meant to be where you went and found God, where it was meant to be of God meeting with his people, that the, the place of Shiloh was that God with his people, meeting with his people in the tabernacle, and again, this is how it was for 300 years. Now, I know that sometimes you can just read that. That's longer than we've been a nation, okay? So this is, this, this is 300 years that that's where God was known. That's where people went to find God. That's the tabernacle. That's where people journeyed. This is where everyone that you can kind of think through in the midst of that, you know, following the days of Joshua, whether it be Deborah, you know, ending up in, in the life of Samuel, where so many came and, and found him here. This was that space where they connected. But in the days of Samuel, when Samuel was a young man, everything changes in part because this space has now become so corrupt. It gives it to us this way in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt, and they did not know the Lord. The sons of Eli, they were the priests. These are supposed to be the religious leaders who are watching over this place of access to God, and he says, they're corrupt. The passage goes on to say that they were immoral, that they were sleeping with the women who would gather in this place. They were ripping people off. They were stealing their sacrifices. They were making horrible spaces about it. And then God just says, they don't even know me. Like these are supposed to be the leaders. They don't know me. And so this place that was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations where people are finding God, boy, God is not being known there. And that leads to the next step. There's a war that breaks out in chapter 4. It says Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and they encamped beside Ebenezer. The Philistines encamped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle against Israel. And when they had joined the battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army of the field. I mean, this is horrendous reality. They're going to battle up against the Philistines and they lose. God's people lose. They lose in the Philistines. They're absolutely conflicted and confused. Like, why, 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 is, why are we not winning? Why didn't we win the battle? How is it that the enemy is, is winning in this moment? And so they gather together. The people had come into the camp, and the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us this day but before the Philistines? Like, why are we not winning? And so they have an idea. They say, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. And when it comes among us, it may save us from the hands of our enemies. So this is a great story. I'm not going to go and read the rest of it. So if you want to read the rest of it, you can. But I just want you to pay attention to it at this moment. They're like, we're losing. How do we win? And they have this idea. We should go get the ark. The ark that was in the middle of that tabernacle was, was the place of meeting with God, the place of God's presence. He says, let's bring it, but you got to notice exactly what they say. Because how they say it is the problem. Let's bring it that it may save us. Let's bring it that it may save us. It's no longer about God. It's no longer about his presence. They now think if they have the ark, they win. As if the ark itself was the point. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. They lose the battle. They bring the ark into the battle. The Philistines wipe them out. They destroy most of the army of Israel. They kill the priests and they steal the ark. 
Hey, if you go on to read the story, it's one of those really fun stories there in Samuel. The ark is then taken into Philistine territory, and, and, and then God judges uh, the, the city where the ark is. And so they send it to another city, and then God judges that city, and they send it to another city. And finally, the Philistines are like, man, we can't do the ark. Like, give them back the ark. And they send the ark back to Israel. But it never comes back to Shiloh. It'll end up over in Beth Shemesh. And it'll stay there throughout the entire ministry of Samuel, throughout all the days of Saul. And about 70 to 80 years later, David becomes king. And when David becomes king, the first thing he does is says, we need the ark back. We need the ark in the center of his people. And he brings it to Jerusalem. He sets up a tabernacle there for everybody to come and worship there. And that's where it's going to stay. That's where it's going to be for a while. But again, if you're tracking through this for a moment, it never comes back to Shiloh. When they lose the ark, when it leaves this moment, it never comes back. And there's a desolation that enters into that city. There's a desolation that that marks itself there, that that's what God is telling Jeremiah. Hey, go and look. Go and look. If you think, hey, that having ark is going to be that which it will not be that which saves you. Go and look at what I did. Go and look at how it happened. Let's go back to the text and just read it. Verse 12 says, but now go to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house, which is called by name, my name, in which you trust, And to this place which I gave you and your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight as I have done to all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. So this time he's speaking of the temple, the temple that Solomon built. He says, I'm going to do it again. And he did. The temple is ruined by, by Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed. Israel's carried into captivity. But here's where we're needing to kind of wrap our brains around it. How did it go wrong? Well, it came wrong when they, when, they, when they lost sight that it was meant to be about God, that they began to see it as an it. They began to see the ark and seeking God as an it. They began to see that which has never been God's heart. The key that you need to kind of grab in the midst of this is it's always about God. It's always about fellowship. And so it's always about repentance. It's always about this place of saying, God, I want to know you. I, I, want, I want to come and, and be yours That's what it's supposed to happen, and that's where they messed it up. Now, you might find yourself thinking, I can't believe they did that. can't believe they carried the ark into the battle and thought that would win. We would never do such a thing. But we do. And you might not even realize you're doing it. So let me kind of put it to you this way. The danger is that you can begin to think of church as an obligation that once you do this, you can go and live however you want. So it happens. It happens in people's minds. So they'll begin to talk about it like this. Like, hey, I need to go to church on Sunday. I need to go to church on Sunday because that just sets the whole week up. And if you, if you go to church on Sunday, that just, boy, if I, if I miss church on Sunday, oh, it's just all bad. But if I go to church, I mean, my family's better. My job is better. I just, you know, I just need church. I need, I need to go to church because church is a great thing. Church is a great space. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the church is a bad thing. But if church is the point, then then we've missed it entirely, because church is not the point. The point of coming to be with God's people is God. We come in the midst of God's people so that we'd find a group of people who are seeking Him, and we come to pray and worship, not because we want this building or this space. We want God. We want Him. And, and so, yes, it's helpful to worship with God's people. Yes, it's helpful to study His Word together. Yes, it's helpful to be together. But if it doesn't draw us close to Him, it is pointless. It is pointless. And the terrible reality is there's a whole bunch of people who feel, hey, as long as I do church on Sunday, it really doesn't matter how I live my life. It really, God doesn't care about Monday or Tuesday. or when, I mean, as long as I do my obligation, as long as I show up on church on Sunday, I'm good, and I'm going, to be, I'm going to be blessed. And God's like, what? No, no, amend your ways. Amend your doings. Repent. Come, come to me, because that's what I'm wanting. And you're, messing, you're, you're missing the entire point if you don't understand it's about God's presence. 
So let's come back to it this way. So I, I showed you a picture a few moments ago. Let me show it to you again. And, and I wish I could say this better than I'm about to say it. I don't have time nor ability because it was just one of these great lessons. Now, it is something that I think I've known before, but it landed for me in a fresh way uh, when I was there in Israel's time. One of the interesting things we discovered is every space that God set his name, a place where he wanted to gather his people, was never on the mountaintops. It was never on the mountaintops. It was never that way at all. In fact, that's where idols were found. And so if you read through the Old Testament, it's like, hey, you know, they, they worship God on all the mountaintops. Where God was meant to be found was like in Shiloh. So his place was always in a valley surrounded by mountains. So if you're here in Shiloh, that's where the, where the tabernacle stood, and then there's mountains all the way around. We talked about it there uh, as we were going up to Mount Carmel, that it wasn't really on the mountaintop. It was on the valley, and, we, and it's the same kind of deal. If you go to Jerusalem, Sometimes people think, hey, Jerusalem is that city on a hill. Well, it is, and it isn't. It's on a little hill. It's on a, a little hill surrounded by mountains. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, it tells us in the Psalms. It's on a little hill with that and then mountains up uh, on the side. Why? Why does God do it this way? Well, it has a really powerful image, and it goes back to the idea of eating. So if you were coming in the tabernacle or temple in the old days and you were coming to get right with God, you would go to the temple and there were five kinds of sacrifices you could make given in the book of Leviticus. Two had to do with your sin. Two had to do with your sin. When you had a, a sin offering, you would bring it to the tabernacle and the whole thing would be burned. The whole thing would be burned. Needed to because you're dealing with your sin. But that was two out of the five. Once you dealt with your sin, there were three types of sacrifices you could make. And the single thing that made those sacrifices significant is you would bring a part of that sacrifice and burn it on the altar. And then you would take the other part, the other half, and you would go up in view of the temple or tabernacle and eat it on the hill. So if you can see these hillsides, uh, you can see what it looks like. You would come and bring that sacrifice, having half of it burned on the altar, and then half of it you would eat up on the hillside. And here's the imagery. It's as if you're having dinner with God. It's as if you've come into a place to have fellowship with Him. That you've come in to say, hey, is God is eating part of this meal? Is this is burning on the altar? And I'm eating part of this meal? Hey, we are fellowshipping together. That's what this whole thing is about, about me having a relationship with God. That's what I'm doing. That's how it works. And, and so the whole thing was this imagery of, this, of, of the whole point of gathering. The whole point of being at the house of God was to have a relationship with God. I mean, that's what he's after. That's the point of what it is. That's the key that's there, and it's the key that runs through the entire Bible. In fact, think about it this way. Last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking, and he says it this way, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. It's the same imagery. And it's an imagery that he's speaking to the church. He says, I'm knocking, and I want to have, I want to eat with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I, I want you and I to sit, I, I want us to enter into such a relationship that, that we know, that you know me and I know you. I mean, that's what we are. That's what the church is. That's what we're about. And yet that's the very reality that was being destroyed. This is why. This is why Jesus came in to cleanse the temple. This is why he was doing this, because he's exposing this thing, that we think about this place, that he's cleansing it, that he begins his ministry and ends his ministry this way, because he's saying, hey, this is what we are. I mean, this is what God's place is supposed to be. It's a place of knowing him. In fact, think about it this way. So, in another incredible significant event in Israel, David goes into the Valley of Elah, and he faces Goliath. You guys all know the story, right? And David and Goliath, lots of great reality there. But as David faces this giant, he makes two proclamations. Two proclamations as to why he wants Goliath to fall. And he says it this way. He says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand that all the earth will know there's a God in Israel. He says, I want you to fall because I want everybody to know there's a God. I want those who are hungering to pray to God and to connect to God will find there is a God in Israel. There is a God to seek. He says, I want the world to know there's a God. Secondly, he says, and I want all the assembly to know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he 
will give you into my hands. He says, I, I want the world to see that there's a God, and I want God's people to trust him. I want God's people to believe in him. I want God's people to know that he is a God worthy of trust and reality and life. And I just love that that's the heart here. It's the same thing that Jesus is saying. It's the same thing that he's doing. In fact, if you want to think about it even just more fundamentally, we think about it sometimes in the great two commandments, love God and love people. It's right here. I want, I want the world to be drawn in. I want you to love the world and let them to be drawn in. And I want you to love God. And when that is missed, you miss everything. You miss everything. Today, I'm encouraging you in that. I don't know if it lands. I don't know if it's making sense. I just am telling you that the heart of God for you this morning is this, a heart of connecting with him. And Jesus grieves. He hates when we gather, and that's not the point. When we gather, and it's not about knowing him, and the world can't find him in our midst. He longs that that would be the place. So that's a good space for us to end this morning. You can pause there, close, close your Bibles, close your notebooks, whatever that is that you have open. And we want to end this morning with just an encouragement right now that this is the heart of God. And it might sound scary. I wonder if it does. I wonder if even hearing these things creates in you fear. I don't want it to. I want to create hope. I just want to tell you, Hey, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, there is hope for you. This is a space where God would tell you, hey, I'll give you a place. I can give you a name. I can rescue you from your sin and I can, I can draw you in. That's what you're supposed to be founding here. And if you are his this morning, you are a broken person that's dealing with sin, but this is a place where your sin can be dealt with, where you can come and say, God, I want to know you boy, I like being at church, but boy, this is not the big, that, that's not the end of this. This is the means to the end. The, the, why I'm here is I want to know God. I want to love Him. I want to be in relationship with Him. I want to be in fellowship with Him. And I want to hold that out to you as an invitation that Jesus would step into your life and say, that's what's supposed to be happening in your heart. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm saying that and you're like, Jim, that's my life. Like, that's my life. I, I love God and I, sh I want people to know good for you. But maybe you would come in and say, I think I might be messing it up. I, I, I'm not sure that anybody around me sees, you know, the hope that you can find in Christ. And sometimes I, I just come and do church. I just come and think, this is it. And I, and I miss the point. Then allow Jesus to step into your heart this morning and cleanse it. Because he who bookended his ministry by cleansing is still in the business of, of turning over tables, not in a way that is meant to destroy us, but rescue us and say, quit messing it up. Come close. Come into fellowship with him. Step, like, okay, that's what this is about. I, I'm about having, you know, where Jesus is, is knocking at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you would open the door, this is like all you got to do. Open the door, and I'll come in, and you and I will eat together. We'll fellowship together, and, and you'll find acceptance, and you'll find just, just life and you'll find connection in this relationship with God. That's who we are. That's what he does. So I want to give you a quiet moment to pray for that. Maybe, again, it's already happening, and this is only encouraging it, but maybe you need just to say, God, turn over any tables you need to turn over. Not anything in my heart that's getting this wrong. Come in and cleanse me again. Make it so that I have a heart for the world, and, and somebody could see Jesus in me and come and say, how do I have what you have? And I would be able to say, I'd love to tell you about that. I, this is, I'm a house of prayer for all nations. I'm a, I'm a space that I want people to know Jesus. And, and today would be a place where you connect with him. That much as you would be in that valley of Shiloh, and you would be there saying, okay, I, just, I want to lay my life down, and, and God join with me in fellowship. That's exactly what he's offering you this morning. So if that needs to just be a cleansing space this morning, would you just ask him to do that? Quietly, wherever that is, just talk to him about that. I'll do the same. I'm going to close in worship in just a moment.
God, I'm asking for this moment, this space, this church, this, this building, this place, but more. I'm asking for each of us individually. Would you make us a house of prayer for all nations? Would you help us to be the light of the world that you've called us to be? That those who are hungry for you, desiring to connect with you, would come and find help and find a people who have what they want, find a people that will help them know you. Would you make us a house of prayer for all nations? Would you make your church in this world a house of prayer for all nations? Then, God, would you do a work inside of us so that we who know you make the main thing the main thing. It's about knowing you. It's about relationship with you. Where we have made church a den of thieves. Where we have made our Sunday obligation a place that makes us feel that we can do whatever we want the rest of the week. Instead of saying, God, I'm I'm hungry for you. I want to have fellowship with you. I want to know you. I want to love you. God, I think about your offer that you are telling us that, Jesus, you would say to us that, behold, you're standing at the door and knocking. If we had opened that door, you would come in and you would dine with us. You would eat with us. You would fellowship with us and, and find a space and a place with you. Make that our lives. Make us a people that are about knowing you, that church would never replace that, that religious observances would never become an end in themselves, but they would always be a means towards seeking and knowing you. God, draw us to hunger for that. Rescue us from anything less than that. Draw us to what you have. We pray for that right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God cause that to be true for you. May he meet you and cleanse and draw you to life. If again, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus, we want this to be a place for you, a place where you could find connection with God. And so we're here. Come up and talk to us afterwards. We'll help you get there. We'd love to pray for you in that and be a part of that. But leaving that with you, I want to invite you now. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We're going to close uh, in a final song of worship. Before we do that, though, one last piece of information from our tour. So our very last site we saw, the very last thing we went to is we went uh, to a cemetery where just a little over 40 years ago, uh, an archaeologist was was digging there and happened to to find a subterranean cavern that had never been discovered before. And in that cavern, he found a silver scroll that literally has the oldest copy of Scripture in existence. Way back from Second Temple era, I mean the oldest, you know, recorded writing of Scripture anywhere on this roll of civil that took years for them to unpack. So deep in this cavern, they found it. Luckily, we had uh, Chris and Catherine, they dived into the space for us, and they're like seven feet deep just to make sure there wasn't another one. Uh, but literally, uh, so on this scroll, on this scroll was written two scriptures, but one of them is the number six passage I'm about to quote to you. I quote every Sunday that literally the oldest copy of the scriptures in existence is something that God gave us that communicates this, this blessing of number six. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his his countenance upon you and give you peace.